There have now been several uh, observational studies which have demonstrated uh, very clear associations with significant hazard ratios, uh, showing a reduction in the risk of developing multiple different types of cancer uh, with exercise and primarily aerobic exercise. Uh, and this is the basis for several of the current exercise recommendations, essentially 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise uh, per week. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment. Facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations minus the hyperbole. Today's episode is with Drs. Irvi Shah and Neil Iyengar. Irvi and Neil are board-certified oncologists from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Both are actively involved in nutrition research, looking at how lifestyle interventions, including nutrition, can affect cancer-related outcomes and work clinically caring for patients with cancer. Irvi specializing in treating patients with multiple myeloma and Neil specializing in treating patients with breast cancer. Today's conversation focuses on what cancer is, its relation to obesity and metabolic health, and what we can do to prevent and treat cancer. With regards to nutrition, we spend time discussing the differences between a plant-based approach and a ketogenic approach, specifically ways in which each of these diets may affect the biological processes that underpin cancer. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Drs. Irvi Shah and Neil Iyengar. You're both oncologists with, uh, to my understanding, slightly different areas of focus, but then sort of uh, intersecting or coming together with this shared interest in nutrition uh, and cancer. I'd love to kind of start here with... Uh, your sort of journeys, your personal journeys into this space and, and what that looks like. Irvi, if we start with you, why oncology and why the interest in studying myeloma? So oncology was a lot because I really liked understanding the whole body system and uh, not just focusing on one organ system. And I think oncology offers that and it also offers that ability to have a really close bond with patients. And then within oncology, I, I actually accidentally came to doing nutrition research and it happened actually from in my oncology fellowship, I ended up having Hodgkin's lymphoma and I was a patient. So going through chemotherapy and having family members ask me questions around um, what do you like, or foods that are important or like maybe you should eat this or that. And I felt like maybe I should know enough about this. And really, we don't get any training in residency or medical school around nutrition. So that created for me this um, side hobby, as you would say, in terms of reading a lot about nutrition along the way. And when I became faculty at MSK, that's really when I started researching nutrition and the microbiome. So it's been the last four or five years now. And myeloma, because I, I just enjoy blood, like I found blood cancers more appealing or interesting to me than uh, solid tumors. But I think that's just a choice preference. So you were you were already on on your path towards becoming an oncologist when you were diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Yes, I was in my first year of fellowship. So really um, strange uh, kind of situation where I'm treating a lot of patients with Hodgkin's or other cancers. And it was actually on my heme malignancy rotation itself. So it was a really um, strange experience. And you've fully recovered from that now? Yes, it's been five years, so it's a long time. Well, congratulations. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Um, and Neil, yourself, I know that you sort of specialize in breast cancer. What was your path into oncology like and, and why the focus on, on breast cancer? Yeah, thanks, Simon. So I think, you know, I had a similar sort of merging of interests, both professionally and, and personally. You know, I've always been scientifically interested uh, in hormone signaling. Uh, when I was an undergraduate and medical student, I worked in a laboratory that studied testosterone biosynthesis and the impact of testosterone on aging. 
Uh, and then when I went into medical school and really got into patient care, uh, as Orvi mentioned, it became clear to me that oncology offers this sacred space of trust between the physician and the patient. And that really resonated with the style of relationship that I wanted to have with my patients. Uh, so I was able to merge my interest in hormone signaling scientifically uh, and my patient uh, connection with uh, the field of breast cancer. And ultimately, by joining the faculty at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, I was able to uh, start essentially a research career where we focused on adipose tissue biology. The breast, of course, is largely composed of adipose tissue. So for the first, the first 10 years of my career, I really focused on understanding how fat cells and fat tissue impact tumor growth. And it became clear to me that we could actually intervene with metabolically based interventions to modify that biology. And that's what launched this interest in nutrition interventions, as well as precision exercise interventions, and certainly some situations in which we combine metabolically targeted medications with lifestyle interventions to prevent cancer and also to improve response to cancer therapy. Yeah, I want to make sure we put a pin in fat cells and obesity and how that relates to cancer and make sure we kind of come back and double click on, on that. I haven't really covered cancer before on this show, not specifically anyway. It's, of course, come up in, in conversation. But I think to help us kind of walk through this terrain, it might be beneficial to start with a few cancer 101s here. So if we, if we start with the broadest question of what is cancer, how, how do you go about sort of defining that? I think, you know, in its simplest form, we could say that cancer is a disease in which some of the body cells start growing uncontrollably and they could potentially have the uh, ability to spread to other parts of the body where they shouldn't be. And you can, ha and usually it's tumors can be benign or malignant. So when you think about a cluster of abnormal cells, if the cluster is, you know, staying in the same place and the cells are well differentiated, this could be a benign tumor or a non-cancerous tumor. And a cancerous tumor is more like a malignant tumor, which could spread and cause um, problems if it wasn't taken care of early. I would add that, yeah, I, I, I completely agree. And I think that it's helpful to think about uh, what has been termed as the, the hallmarks of cancer. Uh, this is also known as the Hanhan Weinberg model, uh, which is essentially key features uh, of cancer or of cells uh, that define what cancer is. And that's now been expanded uh, to also include the environment, what we call the microenvironment around the cancer cell. So essentially, we have biological processes that are working within the cell that define a cancer cell. And as Urvi mentioned, this is uncontrolled growth. Uh, this is uh, utilization of nutrients in a way that takes over from other normal cells uh, and several other features uh, in addition to uh, changes in the surrounding environment like inflammation, uh, and other and other issues that can support the cancer cell growth that together work in concert uh, to essentially create a clump of cells, as Orvi mentioned, uh, that can form a, a tumor, be it a liquid tumor or a solid tumor. That's that clump of cells can then evolve to take on additional features like invasion. So cells that are cancerous can invade uh, through various planes or tissues in the body, which is not a normal process. So that is one of the definition defining features of cancer cells. Uh, and in addition to that, cancer cells can undergo a biological transformation called, called an epithelial mesenchymal transition, which allows for not only invasion, but actual spreading through the body, be it through the blood or the lymphatics, and that's known as metastasis. A term that often comes up is precancerous. What's the what's the difference between a precancerous cell and a cancerous cell, and is it kind of a normal thing for you know, each of us uh, walking around every day with sort of precancerous cells, and then some of these go on to become cancer, but others don't? 
Yeah, I'll go ahead and, and, and start on that one. So yes, uh, so precancerous cells essentially are cells that will become cancer cells uh, if there is no intervention. Uh, and so this is the stage of, of a cancer cell whereby the cell is not actually yet invading into other tissues, uh, but it is growing. It does have the potential to grow and replicate uncontrollably. Uh, and eventually, if left alone, uh, it, it will or can invade and, and metastasize. Now, we do have uh, several, we, we do have several processes in our body uh, that try to protect us from precancerous cells because, of course, our cells are replicating all the time uh, and genetic mis mistakes and replication mistakes occur. Uh, but we have many redundant processes that our bodies have evolved to protect us from those kind of mistakes. Now, there are changes that can allow the precancerous cell uh, to elude some of those protective mechanisms, whether it's a genetic mutation that we've inherited from our parents that prevents uh, a DNA repair or a change in our immune system that doesn't allow the immune system to uh, under or to conduct surveillance. And the cancer cell can sometimes take on features that hide itself from our immune system. Uh, or if there are many uh, precancerous cells and it's just a volume issue, uh, whereby one or, or a handful of those cells are able to slip through, if you will, our protective systems uh, and become a cancerous cell and, and invade. And this is the basis of a lot of our surveillance tests, like a colonoscopy, for example, to try and identify those precancerous lesions so that we can help our bodies by removing those precancerous lesions. Those inbuilt systems that... I'm going to try and summarize this and you can correct me where I'm wrong. Um, those inbuilt systems that we have, essentially our body can detect if a cell is precancerous. And from, from what I've read, I've, I've read about um, various processes like apoptosis, which is often called program sort of cell death and then cellular senescence. Is it these types of things that the body is using to stop a cell moving from precancerous to cancerous, but as you say, sometimes that can break down. Just to add, you know, as Neil already mentioned, but apoptosis is one way, but if apoptosis doesn't happen, then the next, next barrier would be the immune system. So the immune system can clear these abnormal cells and there are many mechanisms by which it does that. And then I think if it passes the immune system and self death has not happened, then that's when cancer is likely to develop. And I think the immune system has a lot of different uh, modifiable and non-modifiable factors at play that lead to, uh, you know, having a healthier or a weaker immune system through which these cells can pass. And so once a cell has shifted from precancerous state to cancerous, and it's sort of, you know, it's escaped those inbuilt systems that would otherwise um, have, have, would it remove the precancerous cell? Is that what happens? It dies? Essentially. So, you know, getting back to that, that concept of apoptosis or senescence, uh, one of the ways that our systems are able to flag those precancerous or abnormal cells, if you will, uh, is by essentially tagging them with a cellular marker. For example, there's a process known as ubiquination. And this is a process through which the abnormal cell is actually tagged with a molecule so that the body can recognize that cell as abnormal and begin that cascade uh, of biological uh, uh, series, if you will, to undergo apoptosis or to undergo cellular senescence, which is a way of, uh, of quieting the cell so that it doesn't replicate. Uh, and, and so, yes, there, th this is one of several processes um, through which the body can recognize which cells it should eliminate. Okay. And just to kind of um, make sure that our, our definitions are clear here. So apoptosis is the cell sort of program cell death. We get rid of that cell. Cellular senescence, it's not, it's not that we're removing that cell, but we're just stopping it from replicating. It's sort of dormant. Yes. Okay. And if a cell ends up becoming cancerous, at that stage, is it, sort of now it's got past these inbuilt sort of surveillance systems of the body and now is it 
it's a disease state and it's going to be a problem or is there something that the body can even do at that stage and recognize that okay this is a cancer cell and the body has other mechanisms that it can kind of tap into to to limit the negative effect of that cell and stop replication and invasion I, I think that's where, again, the immune system comes in. And, you know, if many people have like breast cancer or colon cancer or myeloma, but everybody's disease is very different in terms of how aggressive it is or how quickly it spreads. And some of it could do with the inherent properties of the tumor or different mutations within them. But some of it is also to do with the immune system and the balance. Like there are checkpoints in the immune system which um, kind of keep the, the cancer at uh, bay or doesn't allow it to spread. And once that barrier is um, broken is when, you know, you see more of the metastatic tumors or more aggressive tumors that grow quickly. And I think to elaborate on Irvi's point, you know, maybe 10 years ago, we might have said once the cell becomes cancerous, it's off to the races and, the, and without therapy, there's not much that we could, that the body itself could potentially do. But I think with the recognition and some of the novel discoveries that have been made with regard to the anti-cancer effects of the immune system, we now understand uh, through the work of Jim Allison and Jed Walchuk and several others, uh, that the immune system can indeed recognize these cancerous cells, fully cancerous cells and act to eliminate them. The problem often is that by this point, the sheer volume of cancer cells, once they become invasive and they start to replicate, they do replicate quite, most cancers can replicate quite quickly and have also, will also evolve uh, to shield themselves from the immune system. But now we can help our immune system with immunotherapies uh, to, to utilize some of that inbuilt uh, uh, immunity, those inbuilt immune cells to then combat the cancer cells. So would it be fair to say that most of the, the kind of, uh, field of oncology and research into cancers is focused on the immune system aspect and trying to get the immune system operating more efficiently to, to help either, um, prevent further invasion or to help, to help actually someone become cancer free? I think there have been waves of like research or different important areas that have been studied. And I think genomics had, has been the initial area that was studied, understanding the tumor and it's, it's still being studied, but the next wave was the immune therapy. And I think a lot has happened in the last decade in terms of treatment options and things of how we can harness the immune system to help keep the cancer at check and not have to, um, you know, only uh, use old school chemotherapy options like cytotoxic chemotherapy or chemotherapy that just kills the cancer cells or may cause other normal cells to also die and have more side effects. But how do we harness the immune system or activate it to cause cancer, to keep the cancer under control? And so things like checkpoint inhibitors, CAR T cell therapies, bispecific antibodies are just some examples of immune therapies now in, um, being used front and center. And Simon, the answer that you get might also vary by the type of oncologist that you're speaking with. As, as a breast oncologist, I, you know, I have to say that we've been a little bit disappointed with the uh, efficacy or the lack of efficacy uh, of immunotherapies, uh, although that's changing in certain types of breast cancer. Uh, but as Urvi alluded to, um, the historic sort of gold standard for preventing cancer cells from replicating uh, is by attacking their replication structure, either attacking the cancer cell DNA or attacking the cellular structure of the cancer cell. And this is done through chemotherapy. In breast cancer, in addition to that approach, we can also take a hormonal approach, and this applies to several other types of cancers, prostate cancer, ovarian, and other gynecologic cancers, where cancer cells are often still dependent on hormones like estrogen or testosterone. And if we block the production of those hormones or the signaling of those hormones, we can deprive the cancer cells uh, of their energy or food source, if you will. Uh, and finally, immunotherapy, when combined with some of those approaches, can further increase the efficacy. And this has been an incredibly 
effective approach for several types of cancers, including uh, lung cancer, myelomas, uh, some of the cancers that Urvi treats in the liquid world. Um, and now in triple negative breast cancer, we're starting to see activity uh, of immunotherapy. But we really have to define what is the driving feature of that particular cancer and it may vary even within an anatomic site. A driving feature of one breast cancer may be hormonal, while a driving feature of another type of breast cancer uh, may be immune or, or by cellular replication. Yeah, so I guess that really adds a, an extra layer of complexity to this entire conversation in that not all cancers are the same. Um, so I appreciate that some of my questions are very general and um you know, thank you for, for obviously um, shining a light on the fact that it's not always going to be the exact same um, mechanism or intervention, depending on, on, on the type of cancer we're talking about. Um, again, this is a, a general question, but you mentioned genetics earlier. We've spoken about the immune system. If someone's kind of wondering, do you have a, a sense for the relative contribution uh, of genetics versus the way that we're living, the, how we're sort of navigating our life um, in terms of the development of cancer, the breakdown of some of these kind of, you know, apoptosis and cellular senescence and, you know, cells kind of escaping through that and becoming cancerous. How much of that is just written into our genes and is our fate versus something that we actually have a control over? So I would say that uh, genetics do play a very important role, uh, especially for certain types of genetic mutations. Uh, and the, we, we should clarify here that the types of genetics that we're talking about are germline genetics, which are essentially uh, the genes that we inherit uh, from our parents or that we pass down to our children. And this can be, and often is, distinct from the genetics of the cancer cell. Uh, and so if we think about the germline genetics, what we inherit, um, there are certain genetic syndromes that have what we would refer to as a high penetrance, whereby if a person has that genetic le lesion or genetic mutation, their likelihood of developing a certain cancer can be high. An example is BRCA mutations are strongly associated with the development of ovarian cancer. They're also associated with the development of several other cancers, including breast cancer, but to a lesser degree than ovarian cancer. Uh, but the majority of people actually do not have a genetic syndrome uh, that is strongly associated with the development of a cancer. And so our environment does play a very important role for the majority of people. And we're now learning that even for those individuals that do have a genetic syndrome that predisposes them to cancer, some of the recent research by our group and several other groups have demonstrated that environmental features like diet, like exercise, and like our exposures uh, may not influence whether a person will develop that cancer or not, but may influence how early that person will develop that cancer or how effective certain prevention strategies might be based on what we're exposed to or what kinds of things we're consuming. Around 40% of cancer cases are thought to be related to diet, nutrition, and physical activity from the World Cancer Research Fund, you know, quotes these numbers. I think the American Institute of Cancer Research says about one third of cancers are diet, nutrition, and physical activity related. So somewhere in that range. And then infections can play a role in a small number of cancers like HIV-associated lymphomas, um, HTLV-1 virus. So there are num uh, hepatitis B, some of these. And then, that, and then you have the genetic uh, uh, inherited syndromes and then and, uh, things like in myeloma, you know, 9-11, the World Trade um, Center, 9-11 um, uh, episode has led to an increase in myeloma cases or glyphosate has led to an increase in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma with Monsanto and that whole trial. Interesting. I want to come back to that. I want to make sure we come back to organic versus conventional produce. So that's a question I get quite a lot. 40% um, of, of cancers are influenced by diet, nutrition, and physical activity, I think you said there. What, do you have a sense for how much of that is driven 
by increased adiposity, obesity, given the, the high rates of obesity today, and how much of that would be more so the inherent sort of benefits of particular foods or the inherent you know, benefits of exercise outside of, of weight? I don't think I know the exact percentage of what would be because I think it's hard to you know quantify between the three of them. But there are 13 cancers that have sufficient evidence associated with obesity and the risk of cancer. Myeloma is one of them, breast cancer is another. But the highest on that list is actually endometrial cancer, where I think the relative risk is about seven. And uh, the next one in that list, I think, um, ends up being, uh, uh, I think it's colorectal cancer. Yeah, absolutely agreed. Uh, so in, in and, and I would also add that in, in the post-diagnosis setting, so after an individual has been diagnosed with cancer, we also know that weight changes and shifting into excess adiposity or obesity uh, can unfortunately decrease the efficacy of some of our cancer treatments. Um, it has been estimated that about one in six female cancer deaths are related to obesity and one in seven male cancer deaths are related to obesity. We also know that, I, I like Simon that you use the term adiposity because we also know that body composition and adiposity is directly related to the incidence and outcomes of many of these cancers, perhaps even more strongly uh, than conventional definitions of obesity like body mass index. And what about distribution? Is, you know, if we think about metabolic health, you know, often um, in this conversation, there is emphasis on perhaps the sort of negative or downside effects of fat um, coming down to where your distribution is and someone who has more visceral fat may end up, end up with more sort of metabolic consequences. Do we see a similar kind of story here when it comes to cancer risk? We, we certainly know that the visceral fat is one of the most biologically active depots of fat tissue. Um, the subcutaneous fat uh, can, be, can be biologically active, and there are also certain, some depots of fat that don't cleanly fall into one of those categories, uh, and the breast fat is an example of that. The breast fat, one might consider it to be subcutaneous given its location. On the other hand, we also know that it's a very active, biologically active uh, tissue. Uh, but ultimately, most of uh, the, the research so far does support that it's really visceral fat that's driving a lot of the systemic hormonal signalings. But when we think about the tumor microenvironment, I would argue that regardless of the fat depot, uh, it's what is surrounding the tumor. And many, many cancers directly interface with the fat tissue. Breast, for example, I've brought up several times, but certainly prostate cancer, the prostate is embedded in a fat pad, the colon and several other abdominal pelvic organs are embedded in fat as well. So what's happening in those fat cells is directly relevant and directly impacts uh, the tumor cell uh, itself. For heme malignancies, just to add to that, like blood cancers, they are in the bone marrow, so there's bone marrow fat or adipocytes there, which they directly interact with. So that's another place where you see an interaction between adipocytes and tumor cells. Yeah, let's double click on that on the uh, adipocytes, these fat cells. How, from a mechanistic point of view, is it that they're supplying energy to the cancer cells? Are they revving up inflammation? How are the how are excess fat cells? either increasing your risk of developing cancer or perhaps exacerbating cancer once it's already developed? So we've now recognized that there are several processes through which fat cells can uh, support the growth of tumor uh, of cancer cells. Uh, our group has been very focused on understanding adipose tissue inflammation. And we know that in the breast, in the prostate, uh, around in the fat around the prostate, as well as in the abdominal visceral fat, that fat tissue can become inflamed. Essentially, you can think of it, think of it as a supply and demand is, issue. Uh, as our fat depots grow, let's say that we're, we're taking in excess energy and the body is storing that energy uh, in visceral or subcutaneous fat depots, there will come a point in time where the blood supply of that depot can no longer adequately support that fat tissue. 
And this leads to uh, adipocyte dysfunction or fat cell dysfunction, where the fat cell can actually become necrotic or the cell itself can start to decay or die. And when this happens, the local immune system within the fat tissue, there is a local immune system there, will recognize these dysfunctional cells and will try to clear out those dysfunctional fat cells. But of course, the fat cells are some of the largest cells in our body, while the immune cells are some of the smallest cells in our body. And what we've observed in the breast and around the prostate and several other uh, organs is that uh, tissue or resident macrophages, which are essentially scavenger immune cells, will come in and try to clear out that, uh, that fat cell that's dysfunctional. And they'll do this by, by creating a, a ring or crown of macrophages around that dysfunctional fat cell. This is known as a crown-like structure. You can see this under a microscope. Uh, and that's the, that's the immune system, the local immune system attempting to clear out that, that dysfunctional fat cell. But instead, what happens is those tiny macrophages are engaged in an inefficient process. It's actually called frustrated phagocytosis. And it's exactly what it sounds like. The macrophages are not adequately clearing out that fat cell. And instead, they're spitting out tiny inflammatory molecules. And those inflammatory molecules, in fact, are are growth factors. If, if you think about when you get a cut and it turns red, that's because of inflammatory molecules that are healing the tissue so the cut will close. But if you have a fat depot that is chronically dysfunctional and has all of these crown-like structures chronically, what you end up having is a, a chronic inflammatory process that is supporting the growth of tumor cells. Those tumor cells, as we mentioned that, uh, earlier, are utilizing those inflammatory molecules as growth factors. Uh, and essentially, this inflamed fat tissue can now promote the growth of tumor cells. We've also discovered that several of those inflammatory molecules can directly stimulate or induce the gene that codes for aromatase. And aromatase is the enzyme that's essentially responsible for estrogen biosynthesis. So on top of an inflammatory microenvironment, you also get a pro-estrogenic microenvironment, which is highly supportive of breast cancer growth, for example. But independent of the hormonal process, the inflammation by itself can support uh, tumor cell growth. And finally, we are also recognizing that as that inflammation remains chronic, you, you get uh, fibrosis, which is a structural change in that fat tissue, where now that tissue becomes stiff. It's almost like scarring. And that stiffness also helps uh, create a structure that supports cancer cell growth as well as cr cancer cell invasion. The cancer cells can actually latch on to some of those, some of that fibrosis, almost like a matrix, and use that to travel and invade. And finally, that 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 fibrosis can prevent our therapies from actually making it even making it into the cancer cell. With all of that in mind, and given the current kind of, uh, I guess, food environment, and how difficult it can be for someone to lose weight. You know, it's a it's a it's a very difficult proposition for many people, and you know we see that in lots of studies where you, you know lots of different diets have been shown to reduce uh, body weight in the short term, and and you know a large percentage of people end up putting back you know some if not all of that weight. Um, some people do have good long term success, but but not everyone. And I think recently there's been a lot of attention on these GLP one agonists, semaglutide. I'm, I'm interested, is that something that the field of oncology is looking at and thinking, oh, maybe this is something that could be um, helpful in addition to the other sort of treatment options that patients have? I think we definitely in the oncology world, people have thought about it. And um, I've certainly also thought about it. But I think that um, it's still early to know whether that truly helps because I think that these, these drugs also have an increased cancer risk, like increased thyroid cancer risk. So understanding their long-term effects uh, is something, you know, we, we need to know more about before we say that, you know, we would use that to fix one thing, but maybe cause other issues. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I, I would say that I, I, I think that there is a great potential utility for GLP-1 agonists in our in our toolkit, if you will. Uh, 
I would certainly argue that um, if we have an individual who's struggling to lose weight and who may have a lot of excess adiposity, that one of our priorities is to reduce that adiposity. And uh, we, we do try to start with diet and exercise because of all of the other uh, independent effects that are protective against cancer. Uh, but we also know that if we can't uh, get an individual to lose weight, uh, that is a major priority for improving outcomes after a cancer diagnosis. And this is where drugs like GLP-1 agonists uh, may be really useful. I'll, I'll tell you really quickly, I, I have a patient who, who is really dear to me, and she has really advanced triple negative breast cancer, metastatic triple negative breast cancer, and a diagnosis of diabetes. And she uh, was in that morbidly obese category. Unfortunately, we had treated her with multiple lines of therapy, and her cancer kept progressing. And we have all of these great clinical trials of new cancer therapies, but we weren't able to get her on to any of these trials because her diabetes had caused her neuropathy, which is essentially a numbness and tingling of the fingers and toes. Uh, and cancer therapies can cause neuropathy. Her endocrinologist started her on a GLP-1 agonist. She lost a lot of weight, a lot of fat, and her neuropathy essentially disappeared. And we were able to get her onto a clinical trial and, and now she's doing really quite well. So I think in, in addition to some of the direct effects like weight loss of GLP-1 agonists that impact cancer outcomes, there are indirect effects by eliminating some of the uh, uh, complications of hyperadiposity or some of the complications of diabetes that also impact our ability to treat cancer. We can improve outcomes with drugs like that. I want to learn more about nutrition and exercise and the kind of the modifiable risk factors, um, things that people can control outside of genetics and gender and age and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I'm also mindful of just broadly before we sort of get into that, how do we think about preventing versus treating cancer? Is it, this, is it the same types of food and diet going to, that, that are best for preventing cancer? Is that necessarily going to be the same or the best diet, um, nutritional intervention for treating cancer? And the, the same goes for exercise. I, I think in the nutrition space, we can think about in cancer three different buckets. So like you said, prevention, uh, treatment, but also the survivorship space. So I think these are three areas in terms of a patient's uh, cancer um, life we would talk about. And in terms of the prevention side, often the patients don't know that they're going to develop a cancer, but there are a lot of precancerous or early detectable um, states. Like in myeloma, we have something called MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy and small ring myeloma. And we know that a small percentage of these patients will go on to progress to develop cancer. So there is a real opportunity there for prevention and trials in the prevention space. And then in the treatment setting, you know, uh, as combinations or synergies with chemotherapy or immune therapies, I think diet can play a big role, like, you know, with checkpoint inhibitors or other immune therapies, can it actually improve um, the, the therapy response rates or things like that. So we've looked at um, also in the survivorship setting. So our group um, looked at, you know, can certain dietary patterns or the microbiome alter the likelihood of uh, achieving complete remission in, in the survivorship setting? And, and I think so those are three different ways to think about it. And I think in each setting, um, there are slightly different um, things that may be needed, but it could also be that it's pretty similar. And I think we're still trying to understand that. I think for s prevention, we really know well what um, kind of a dietary pattern would be important based on like, you know, the American Institute of Cancer Research guidelines that talk about prevention and survivorship guidelines. And these are also from the World Cancer Research Fund. But in the treatment setting, I think that's where a lot of the research is going and we don't really have clear guidelines because maybe patients are losing weight or having side effects from their treatments. It might be worth just um, highlighting what some of those, or what broadly, what are those recommendations, the, the established recommendations currently based on the data we have for prevention and for um, reducing risk of recurrence? 
uh, sure. So actually, the American Institute has like six, uh, 10, 10 guidelines and six out of those 10 are actually on nutrition or diet. So it's one is like try to maintain a healthy weight, be physically active, eat fruits, uh, whole grains, vegetables and beans, uh, avoid fast food, processed foods, refined sugars, all of that, uh, limit consumption of red meat and processed meat. Um, sugar sweetened drinks is another one. Um, alcohol uh, is, is another one limiting that. And then um, uh, looking at uh, uh, not using supplements for cancer prevention, because there are a lot of studies that show that maybe supplements actually do not really help if you're looking at certain one thing. And then breastfeeding is another one. And then the last one they talk about in these 10 is like, try to follow the about nine recommendations. So and I think a, a nice theme there that that um, hopefully comes through those recommendations uh, is that it, it, it's really about patterns, overall patterns, especially in the risk reduction setting. You know, I really think about risk reduction as how can we stack the deck in our favor? Uh, because one message I think we need to make very clear and, and that we get asked is, did, did I cause my cancer? by eating in a certain way. And I think we can never fully be able to answer that question, but we can certainly stack the deck in our favor. And with so many competing hazards, you know, you set your foot out the door every day and you're bombarded, your body is bombarded with competing hazards. Um, we can try to minimize some of those hazards through, through the recommendations that Urvi just went through. What can you tell people about the type of studies that would be used to inform most of these recommendations because if I, let's say i'm i'm thinking about cardiovascular disease and the recommendations for um minimizing your chance of having a heart attack well there you know there are a number of i guess established biomarkers you can run sort of shorter term studies and just look at changes in in things like uh, apob or ldl cholesterol for example and you can kind of use that as a surrogate to say okay well that's an established biomarker we we know that you know this intervention improved that it likely improves your cardiovascular disease risk and and so you can run a lot of different interventions and studies and look at biomarkers over a short period of time and rather than having to do something over five or 10 years and look at those harder outcomes of, did someone have a heart attack or die? Um, so I guess that's more of a, a statement, but my question is, um, is there a similar set of biomarkers that allows a similar sort of approach to studying um, nutrition and, and cancer? That's a major focus uh, of research right now. And we're certainly not where uh, the field of cardiology is in terms of, of established biomarkers. Um, there are some. Um, and I think that in the cancer prevention setting, uh, this is an incredibly complex setting. And of course, here, you know, where, whereas in cardiology or in, in the cardiometabolic space, we may be, t we, we may be talking about one very clear outcome or event, a myocardial infarction, right? Whereas with regard to cancer risk reduction, we're really talking about how do we reduce the risk of preventing hundreds of different types of diseases? Because that's essentially what cancer is. It's, it's a very diverse bucket of diseases. Uh, and that will require a diverse panel of biomarkers. And we do have some biomarkers uh, that help us. So for example, we know that a biomarker that's very well known, insulin, uh, is predictive of the risk of developing several different types of cancers. Uh, we know that several other metabolic hormones, uh, leptin, a hormone secreted by fat cells, is also predictive of the risk of developing several different types of cancers. Uh, we also have specific um, uh, molecules to uh, specific types of cancers uh, that we can look at. So, for example, in prostate cancer, PSA, prostate-specific antigen, uh, is a biomarker that we can look at and whether or not diet or exercise can modify uh, that particular biomarker is currently being studied. There's uh, also a new interest in looking at circulating uh, DNA. So this is known as cell-free DNA, and we can identify what uh, markers in the DNA may be associated with 
cancer DNA, cancer cell DNA. This is known as circulating tumor DNA. Uh, and that's an active area of research right now. Can we use diet or exercise to modify circulating tumor DNA, which is very, very small amounts of cancer, but if we can modify it through something like diet before the cancer reaches a level that's uh, burdensome, that may be our opportunity to actually prevent cancer. So this is sort of a long-winded way to say that we're not quite yet there uh, in terms of having something like a, a lipid panel to follow and help prevent uh, a myocardial infarction. But that is sort of the blue sky vision of, of the research that's going on is to create a panel of biomarkers that can predict for common cancers and that can more importantly be modified by interventions. So would it be fair to say that most of the current kind of general recommendations are based on large scale, like observational studies, looking at populations and sort of relative risk of developing cancer based on, you know, high versus low red meat intake, high versus low fruit and veg intake, et cetera? Certainly the guidelines, like, you know, these guidelines that I just mentioned, and most studies in oncology are association studies and epidemiologic population-based studies. But I think, you know, we, in terms of understanding mechanisms like around processed meat or red meat and colorectal cancer, there are, and even in myeloma or other cancers, there are mouse models or preclinical -pre studies looking at how can mechanisms be understood in terms of how these foods may affect cancer growth or progression. So I think, I think about it as in the preclinical setting, you can look at patient tumor samples and associate it or look at mouse models and uh, look at that. And then in the clinical setting, it's mostly epidemiologic studies, but large um, interventional studies are also now taking place. And, you know, that would be the next place. And I think that's the gold standard. So hopefully with these better biomarkers, we can have endpoints similar to cardiology where we can actually study them in interventional clinical trials. And I think that's where the microbiome comes into where, you know, we, before uh, when we study diet, we're only looking at clinical biomarkers or uh, metabolic biomarkers, but we didn't have really other tools to study. Now with being able to study the immune system and profile it really well, and also look at the microbiome and understand changes. Diet is one of the largest drivers of the microbiome and it can rapidly change it. So I think that's a place where, you know, you can already start seeing associations. And then if you know a certain microbiome pattern is associated with cancer progression you know if there's an indirect link the same way as you said in cardiology could happen let's let's imagine a hypothetical scenario here um, a patient's in front of you and i'm sure this has happened many times you've, you've both experienced this but um, patients in front of you they they have a cancer diagnosis and they're sort of talking to you about all the different treatment options that are available and they say to you, Doc, you know, how powerful is nutrition? And what I'm getting at here is the kind of magnitude of effect, if you have a sense for, for the magnitude of effect that, that nutrition may have on cancer development and helping to, to treat cancer relative to other interventions that are available, pharmacotherapy, exercise, et cetera. And I ask this question because I think you know, sometimes I watch the conversations on social media and I think in some, sometimes I think particularly dietitians and nutritionists, um, we can get ahead of ourselves a little bit. And, and if I look at the conversation around mental health, I think right now there's, you know, lots of claims made being made online about nutrition and mental health and in many ways minimizing other interventions, but there's not actually a whole lot of good outcome data on diet and, and mental health. Um, so I'm curious as to kind of how you how you see the the magnitude of effect of nutrition. You might not be able to answer this now, but do you have some sort of, of sense where this fits within all of the available interventions to someone? How important it is? Yeah, it's a great it's a great question because we do get asked that all the time. Um, and I, I think that, you know, my, my approach to this is that it really the answer depends on, of course, the type of cancer uh, and, and, and where that person might be uh, in their cancer journey, if you will. Uh, and I think here defining the goals is really important. So nutrition 
what I, what I will tell my patients is that nutrition is indeed a powerful tool, but how we use it depends on what the goals are and also what the current status is. So nutrition can be very helpful or dietary interventions can be very helpful uh, for dealing, for example, with side effects of cancer treatments. And this is not necessarily an anti-cancer efficacy endpoint, but ultimately, if an individual is able to better tolerate their cancer therapy, you, th you can then potentially achieve a higher, what we call relative dose intensity, which is essentially delivery of the cancer treatment. Uh, and, and there, I would say we've used a powerful tool such as nutrition to get that treatment into the system and treat that cancer. On the other hand, um, a, a purist might say, I'm interested in what is the anti-cancer effect of that dietary intervention that you're talking about. And that's where, of course, we have a lot of ambiguity, a lot of claims that have yet to be substantiated. And this gets to the concept that Irvi was just talking about, whereby we have a lot of observational data and we have a lot of strong molecular observational data, which is essentially taking the observations and validating them against biological processes in, in, in the laboratory, as Irvi was discussing. Uh, but that is not the gold standard prospective randomized control trial, which is required to introduce a new cancer therapy uh, into the clinic. And so when somebody asks me that question, what I will say is, well, first of all, the type of dietary intervention that we recommend for you is going to, will, we have to use the same process that we use for selecting a drug for an individual. We have to look at their genetics, we have to look at their genomics, we have to look at the type of cancer, and then we have to look at what biological processes is that type of dietary intervention targeting and could that be useful for that individual's cancer. This is why we and others are starting to now do this kind of work where we're running randomized control trials, testing different types of dietary interventions with, uh, with clean cancer-related endpoints so that ultimately we can have a more robust answer to that question. But for now, a lot of our advice is indeed based on molecular epidemiology uh, and advising patients more so on methods to increase treatment delivery. Okay. This patient now says, thank you for explaining that to me. Um, I've, I've heard from various people about the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet. I've heard from other people about a ketogenic diet and I believe this is the rationale for that really wonderful paper that the two of you put together um, that kind of walked through how do different diets uh, potentially address different biological processes happening in cancer. Um, so perhaps we can, let's start this exploration of this paper with, if a patient says to you, should I be going down the, the sort of high carb uh, plant-based direction or is a ketogenic diet going to be better for me in treating my cancer? So just if we think about it from, again, like we talked about the prevention, treatment and survivorship settings, I think what we allude to in the paper or talk about is in the prevention setting, um, a lot of the large population studies from the USA, UK and France uh, show that plant-forward diets or plant-based diets are associated with reduced risk of developing cancer overall and also specific cancers. So that's in the epidemiologic setting. But when we think about it in terms of mechanisms, um, you know, it, with a plant-based diet, we're thinking about the increased fiber, which could reduce intestinal transit time or uh, increase butyrate levels in the stool, which have anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory properties. And then also we do know, and um, you know, you've had this in, in your previous episodes as well, like how a plant-based diet can affect diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease and how Neil alluded to that it's not just the direct effect, but the indirect effect of being able to tolerate treatments well. So I think that the strongest data in terms of just directly and indirectly affecting tumor is through plant-based diets. Um, and through multiple mechanisms, even insulin, insulin-like growth factor. Um, and when we think about ketogenic diets, they too have uh, specific ways that they could be through the ketone bodies and weight loss. 
Um, but those are things that need to be looked at in very specific treatment settings because ketogenic diets can sometimes be hard to sustain long term. So we should think about it as a therapeutic, synergistic intervention, maybe with treatment for specific cancers once a trial shows a positive result and then think about it for the patient. So as of now, if I am telling patients, I would say that, you know, do whatever diet you might want to, but if you can get 80 or 90% of your calories from unprocessed plant foods, then that would be important. So if you do like a ketogenic diet, try to have the ketogenic diet be more plant-based because we know that there is some anti-cancer benefits to the plant-forward foods. Yeah, you know, I, I, I completely agree. And, and, and I, I, I think of it, you know, the, my, my perspective on this is you know, when we are looking at the risk reduction setting, right? What, what is the path that has the least propensity for going astray? And we know from a large body of work that as, as we alluded to, that the effects of a plant forward, a majority plant based diet, uh, has many, many effects that all work in concert together uh, to probably have the greatest anti-cancer or risk reduction um, effect. And in addition to that, uh, I would argue, um, has less of a chance of, of, of going astray. So for example, if somebody's following a ketogenic diet, uh, an individual may feel inclined uh, or, or even be misinstructed uh, to consume more processed meats. Uh, for example, because yes, you can generate ketones by eating processed meats, but we also know that that processed meat uh, can has has a direct and dangerous impact on cancer development. Uh, for example, colon cancer. Whereas in a in a plant whole food plant based diet, yes, of course you can eat. Doritos and Twinkies all day and say that you're eating a plant forward or plant based diet. Uh, but I think that it's, 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 it's a little more clear that you really need to be consuming f fruits and vegetables and, th and, and, and things that are not as processed. Um, and in addition to that, I would also argue that most of our data, uh, when we talk about cancer as a diverse disease state, most of our data indicates that whole food plant based diets impact many of the processes that are common amongst a lot of these cancers. Whereas, as, as Urvi said, the, the ketogenic approach or some of these subspecialized diet approaches, they may be successful biologically for s certain pathways, but those certain pathways may not be as common across all cancers and may be more effective in very specific s scenarios or situations. Let's double click on a few of the, I guess, the key elements of a, of a plant-based, a whole food sort of plant forward diet. And then I want to come to keto and talk about perhaps some of the, the benefits there with regards to lowering um, glucose intake or increasing ketones and how this could be affecting some of the cancer processes in someone who has cancer. Um, so with the, the, whole food plant forward diet you mentioned their fiber and increasing um, or sorry decreasing intestinal transit time why is that beneficial uh, to reduce the time for the different you know when we consume food there are um, toxins that you know build up in the colon so we want to have regular bowel movements to get rid of those and when there's more time for these toxins to interact with the colonic mucosa there's a higher risk to develop mutations or develop cancer so some of it is just to have regular bowel movements and have these toxins not build up in the body and how important do you see the sort of phytochemical content of these foods being the flavonoids and, and polyphenols. So perhaps not considered essential nutrients like a vitamin and mineral, um, but still affecting our physiology. Are they playing a, a role in sort of protecting our cells against cancer? I think very much so. Um, and that's probably why fruits and vegetables are so high on the list in terms of and why plant-based diets have these anti-cancer properties is through the flavonoids. We also published in uh, clinical cancer research looking at in myeloma where patients had higher dietary diversity of flavonoids 
had higher like this was associated with higher levels of butyrate in the stools and higher likelihood of sustained MRD negativity or complete remission with their myeloma too. So I think you know that's just one example, but there are other uh, studies looking at how flavonoids have these anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory properties. Quick one. If you'd like some inspiration to take your fermented food game and gut health to the next level, be sure to check out my digital plant-based ferments guide. Inside are some of my favorite recipes, including my soy labne and homemade kombucha. Learn more at theproof.com forward slash ferments. That's theproof.com forward slash ferments. And I believe there's been some clinical trials looking at antioxidant supplements so if someone's thinking well do i need to eat the fruits and vegetables or can i just take a capsule what do we know about that you know i think um a lot of the the problem with with supplementing uh like that is first of all a lot of folks will supplement without knowing what their baseline values of those of those um supplements are um and that isn't necessarily harmful, but it may be unnecessary. So there are, I, there are certainly some vitamins, let's say vitamin D, for example, um, where we have, we have seen studies that have suggested that, uh, vitamin D deficiency may support the growth of certain types of cancers and supplementing to get to an appropriate level, uh, is indeed, um, recommended, but we haven't seen studies that suggest that over supplementing or getting over uh, uh, above and beyond more is better. We have not yet uh, seen that. The other issue is, and I think Urvi alluded to this, is that a lot of these um, nutrients work synergistically. And by sort of a reductionist kind of isolation of one vitamin or one type of supplement, we're oftentimes not getting that kind of synergy that's needed uh, or that exposure time uh, in the gut. And ultimately, a lot of this, uh, a lot of this approach is, is how can we impact the microbiome and increase diversity? And we certainly know that a more diverse microbiome uh, can support the, the prevention of tumor growth, both within the colon itself, but also systemically uh, in the body by reducing inflammation, by reducing uh, negative hormone signaling, uh, and, and several other biologic pathways. So I think ultimately, a single supplement kind of approach uh, is really not harnessing uh, the benefit of that particular uh, agent. And on top of it, I always say, especially for the antioxidant question, that cancer cells can also utilize those supplements and in fact are more likely to do that. That's one of, going back to the beginning of our conversation, one of the definitions of a cancer cell is that it usurps those energy sources or nutrient sources from other cells in our body. And so if we're giving our bodies high dose vitamins or high dose supplements, uh, it may be actually utilized by the cancer cells. And there have been studies that have shown that certain vitamin supplementation uh, can support the growth of prostate, lung, and other types of cancers. The impact on the microbiome and, and reduced inflammation rem reminds me I had Professor Christopher Gardner on the show from Stanford, and he ran a, a clinical trial last year or the year before looking at fermented foods that showed some some modulation of the microbiome and, and reduced um, inflammatory markers. Are we a fan of, of fermented foods here? I think there's the studies have shown that fermented foods are associated with increased diversity of the gut microbiome. And as Neil mentioned, div diversity in um, the microbiome is a major marker of improved survival in most many cancers so you know in, especially in the heme malignancy setting um, and post transplant setting there are a lot of trials from uh, my colleagues and others where we've looked at even our paper we've looked at higher diversity shows an association with either improved response rates or better progression free survival or better overall survival and diversity of the gut microbiome comes from the diversity of foods one eats or that's at least one modifiable way to improve diversity so i really like one of these paper this paper from McDonald's in 2018, which talks about with over 10,000 um, people in the general population, but showed that if you have more than 30 types of plant food per week, 
the gut microbiome di- biome diversity is higher. So I think that that's one kind of way where patients with cancer, if they want to improve their gut microbiome diversity, could try to implement something like that, where they're eating a variety of plant foods, especially in the world now where we all tend to have our favorite foods and try to stick to that. And we don't really think about things beyond our comfort zone. Are there clinical trials that are actively looking at cancer patients and dietary interventions that are um, sort of uh, adjunctive to the the pharmacotherapy that they're doing? Yes, yes, there's there, there's quite a few, and in fact, we are running some several here. Um, you know, we we are testing for. I'll give you a, a few examples, and I know Irvi has some as well. But uh, in in the breast cancer setting, we're testing a plant-based diet, and this is a fully plant-based diet with uh, with no animal products. Um, with in combination with structured exercise. And that's in addition to uh, pharmacologic therapy for breast cancer, specifically hormone therapy. So we're combining aromatase inhibitors, which is one of the most common treatments uh, for hormone receptor positive breast cancer that uh, represents about 80% of breast cancers uh, with this dietary and exercise intervention and the rationale there is that aromatase inhibitors, which stop the body's production of estrogen, uh, have, are, are very effective for breast cancer treatment. But we also know that they're unfortunately less effective for those individuals with higher levels of adiposity and for obese individuals. Uh, in addition to that, aromatase inhibitors are diff- more difficult to tolerate because of side effects for those individuals that are obese or have high levels of body fat. For example, joint pain is a very common side effect of aromatase inhibitors. And if we look at our colleagues in the rheumatologic world, we have seen some studies that have shown that plant-forward diets can actually reduce joint pains. That may be due to decreased inflammation and so forth. And so if we can combine a dietary intervention, a plant-based diet, with a standard breast cancer therapy to not only reduce side effects like joint pain, but also do all of the other wonderful things we've been talking about, like reduce inflammation uh, and improve gut microbiome diversity and potentially even have a direct anti-cancer effect. That would be, that would be a winner in my mind. But of course we have to prove that. Now on the flip side, um, you know, we, we talked about the ketogenic diet and there are very specific settings where that might be useful as well. So in breast and other cancers, there are certain types of tumors that have a very specific genetic mutation, not inherited, but within the cancer cell, uh, that essentially make that tumor more dependent on insulin. And the treatments that we use for those types of tumors paradoxically increase the levels of insulin in our circulation. So you have this anti-cancer therapy that directly attacks the cancer cell, and yet it's creating an environment where the cancer cell may actually eventually become resistant to that cancer therapy through hyperinsulinemia, hyperglycemia, and so forth. And that's a setting where we're testing the ketogenic diet because of its uh, insulin-lowering effects uh, and also by shifting the energy source to ketones and being re- less reliant on carbohydrates, insulin signaling like IGF, insulin growth factors and so, so forth is minimized. And that may be beneficial uh, for those types of cancers or that type of treatment. That clinical trial is also ongoing right now to test that hypothesis. Ketones like beta-hydroxybutyrate, um... I've heard people kind of speak of them of having their own sort of anti-cancer properties. Um, so is is the is the benefit from from reducing insulin and, and not having as much glucose around, or do these ketones also seem to be affecting sort of some of the biological processes of of cancer? Yeah, that, that so that's part of the 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 biologic rationale for testing a ketogenic diet in that setting uh, is that the actual anti-cancer effect of, of BHB beta hydroxybutyrate uh, may be useful there. Now, I think the 
you know, the ideal trial and, 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 an, and a trial that uh, we may want to run one day will actually be comparing plant-based diets versus a ketogenic diet in that kind of tumor situation to really tease out, is it the insulin lowering effects? Because we also know plant-based diets have significant insulin lowering effects as well. Uh, or is it the actual ketone effect? I think that based on what we've seen in, in preclinical studies um, in, in, in a human where the system is very complex and diverse, um, I still would favor, until we see the clinical trial, trial data, I still would favor a plant-based approach because some of those other phytochemicals and, and microbiome diversity that we've talked about are a little bit more accentuated in a plant forward diet uh, than perhaps in some of the ketogenic diets that are out there. How critical is the the um, ketogenic sort of state and the production of ketones versus being low carb? Because I guess where my mind's going here is what about a hybrid? What about a more plant forward, plant rich, low carb diet? Are you potentially getting the best of both worlds I don't think it's going to be something people can really adhere to long term or not many people um, from a practicality and social point of view, but from a, a quick sort of intervention. Is that something that you've you've thought about? So, so I do have to I, I love that question. And I and I have to continue to elaborate on this clinical trial because that is exactly the hypothesis that we're testing. So this trial actually uh, that I mentioned testing the ketogenic diet has three arms. One of the arms is a ketogenic diet. And this is, I like to call this a precision nutrition trial. And, and Urvi does these kind of trials as well, where we actually deliver the food to our patients so that we can generate the exact energy requirements and macronutrient requirements. Uh, because as I think you've alluded to, Simon, a ketogenic diet, it can be challenging. And many times people who are following a ketogenic diet are not necessarily actually in ketosis. Uh, and so that that arm of the trial, the ketogenic arm, we are trying to uh, d uh, make sure that folks are in ketosis. We're monitoring daily BHB levels and so forth. But a second arm in that study is a low carbohydrate diet. And so this is certainly a less restrictive diet. We will still be monitoring uh, ketones in that arm. And, and for our patients that are enrolled thus far, those patients in the low carb arm, they are not in ketosis, uh, but they are consuming a, a low carb diet. The third arm in that trial is actually an SGLT2 inhibitor, which is a, which is a diabetes medication. So ultimately we're asking the question, uh, is it that you have to simply be low carb, which would suggest more of an insulin lowering effect? Do you actually have to be in ketosis, which would support the hypothesis that ketone bodies and the anti-cancer effect of ketone bodies are playing a driving role here? Or is it just too hard to adhere to any of that while you're undergoing cancer therapy and people should be prescribed a diabetes medication and SGLT2 inhibitor while they're on this type of cancer therapy? So that, that, that's the, the question we're testing right now. To add to that, um, Simon, I was thinking like what you were asking about a plant-based or a plant-forward ketogenic diet. I think, uh, you know, when people talk about a ketogenic diet or a low-carb diet, it's not inherently clear what exactly they're eating because you could do a ketogenic diet with eating a lot of processed foods, as Neil said, or you could do a ketogenic diet with eating nuts seeds, avocados, olive oil, and stuff like that with a little Mediterranean touch to it. And I think both may achieve the ketosis, but I think they're very different kinds of keto diets and they might have very different effects on the immune system and uh, cancer and things like that. And I think the same thing applies for a plant-based diet when, when patients or people say like, oh, I'm vegan or vegetarian, um, there's a big variety in what that could actually mean because a whole food plant-based diet is where it's very minimally or unprocessed foods and mostly plant-based, whereas a vegan diet could be a lot of junk food or, um, you know, um, and a vegetarian diet could be a lot of dairy and eggs and things like that. So it's, it's and processed as well. So I think when we think about plant-based or keto diets, it's also important to talk about really what other food groups or how we're thinking about planning them. And Neil, coming back to your the clinical trial you're doing that is looking at a whole food plant-based diet plus exercise, I believe it was uh, patients with breast cancer or a certain type of breast cancer, I think. Um, 
incredible study. I'm really looking forward to seeing the result, results of that, and I'm sure many people w will. Um, first part of the question is, when do you expect to kind of have results from that? And the second is, I'm sure people are going to, to follow up with this um, once it's published, wanting to know well, what's the relative contribution of the nutrition changes versus exercise. Is there any way of teasing that out? Yeah, uh, that, so, so firstly, um, we, we hope and, and I think the results should be out soon. Uh, by soon, I mean one to two years. Um, and that's, that's soon for, for us. Um, but, uh, we, we are about 80%, uh, finished with the trial. Uh, and then we'll go into all of the analyses and, you know, the, the, the reason why we had incorporated the exercise component uh, is because this is primarily originally designed as a, as a weight loss trial. Um, the, the major problem with, uh, with breast cancer treatment, especially hormonally based breast cancer treatment, is most of our patients, unfortunately, gain weight. And a lot of that has to do with the hormonal manipulation, uh, but also the age of patients, uh, the median age of patients that when they're diagnosed with breast cancer, this is typically um, at a stage in life where um, uh, uh, hormonal changes are driving weight gain. Uh, and so in this trial, all participants have a body mass index of 27 or greater. This is where we really start to see the risk of, of poor outcomes start to rise at that BMI. Uh, and the incorporation of exercise uh, was so that we are not relying solely on energy restriction uh, for weight loss. So some of that ex energy expenditure will help. Now, can we tease out the effect of the plant-based diet versus the exercise component? This is where a lot of the biological assays or tests will be helpful. So we'll be looking at um, uh, uh, types of assays like metabolomics, for example. This is where we can look at uh, small molecules in the plasma. And through the work of others, we know that certain types of metabolites are associated with, with certain plant foods. And we'll be able to measure um, how, how compliant, for example, an individual is with eating a plant-forward diet by looking at certain metabolites. And so by, by looking at those kind of biological endpoints, I do think we'll be able to uh, maybe not 100% tease out or differentiate the effects, uh, but I do think we'll be able to look at um, what is driving specific biological changes uh, in the breast tissue and in the microbiome and in, in, in the blood as a, 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 and the system as a whole. Are they the main outcomes? Are you looking at the kind of histology of the, of the cancer? Uh, so uh, these individuals essentially are, are actually cancer free at this point. They've undergone uh, surgery and now they're on hormone therapy to prevent recurrence. And um, here we're, we're looking at the primary outcome is looking at changes in the breast tissue itself, because there have been several changes in the breast tissue that we know are predictive of developing recurrence or that support recurrence. So if we can minimize those changes in the breast tissue, um, that uh, we think will translate to overall reduced recurrence risk. I have a few more foods that I'd like to, to get your thoughts on that I think uh, are somewhat controversial and it's not not every day I have two oncologists on the show who are also researchers so I need to make sure that I I ask these we were speaking about phytochemicals before and Neil this one might be more directed at you given your interest in breast cancer um, often soy and soy isoflavones come up here um, what are your thoughts on the inclusion of, of soy in someone's diet um, from both a prevention of cancer point of view, but also from the point of view, if someone has cancer or uh, is cancer free and is trying to, to reduce their risk of recurrence. So this is, I think is where the dose question becomes really important. What, what is the dose of, of, of soy or soy components like isoflavones that an individual is getting in their diet? Um, we, we can turn firstly to the observational or epidemiologic literature to kind of uh, give us the first clue there. And when we look at uh, East Asian populations, for example, where we know soy intake is typically higher than, than most Western populations, 
we actually see associations with a lower incidence of breast cancer and a lower incidence of hormone receptor positive breast cancer. Uh, and, and so this, this, this hypothesis, which gained a lot of mainstream support that soy supports estrogen, supports breast cancer growth, is actually not borne out in the observational liter literature when we look at these different populations. Now, when you look at Western populations or U.S. populations and soy intake and cancer risk, there is a, there are some slight differences there, and it may have to do with the quality or the source uh, of the soy. Uh, but ultimately, we don't have a clear relationship between soy intake or a linear relationship between soy intake and increased risk of, of cancer, or increased risk of breast cancer. Um, that being said, there have been studies uh, that have been conducted here and elsewhere that have looked at the biologic impact uh, of soy and soy isoflavones. And we do know that um, certain estrogens uh, or estrogen metabolites can be increased with increased consumption of soy. But we also know that um, at, at in, the, in the prevention or risk reduction stage, that certain estrogen metabolites can actually be protective against breast cancer uh, development. There was a study conducted by uh, Dr. Jackie Bromberg here at Memorial where we looked at individuals who had been diagnosed with breast cancer and they volunteered to drink either a soy-based shake or a non-soy-based shake before undergoing their breast surgery. And ultimately we were able to look at the tumors from the surgery uh, of those who consumed the soy shake multiple times a day versus those uh, who didn't, so high soy dose versus low soy dose, or no soy dose, I should say. And what we found were in the tumors of those individuals who consumed high doses of soy, there were genetic programs that were turned on that were worrisome, that would suggest that uh, cellular replication, cancer cell repl replication uh, would be accelerated. Uh, but ultimately, when we looked at the outcomes that really matter, the size of the tumor, uh, recurrence of the tumor, uh, and several other clinical outcomes, we saw no difference uh, between the two arms. And that might be because of uh, the duration of the intervention. You know, ultimately, we try to get people to surgery to remove the tumor as quickly as possible. Uh, so if people are chronically exposed to high doses of soy, perhaps some of those pathway alterations would translate to more aggressive tumors. But I think ultimately, when we put all of this data together, it supports the, the conclusion that moderate doses of soy have not been associated uh, with increased risk or worse outcomes, particularly in breast cancer, where the estrogen question is central. And, and to just add to that, he's like really nicely summarized it. But to add to it, you know, um, when we think about soy, we're thinking about the soy proteins in it. We're thinking about flavonoids. We're thinking about fiber. So if you're eating minimally processed soy, you're like tofu, tempeh, edamame, you're getting all of these components. But often soy, when it's studied in mouse models or even maybe in the study that Neil alluded to, if you're thinking about a high soy protein isolate or things like that, then it's kind of stripping away the other parts of soy which make it have those properties maybe as a combination like we talked about not reductionism so i think when we think about soy protein isolate there may be a higher risk or that may be something to reduce or have in minimal amounts but when we think about tofu i think it's a very different thing than when we think about soy protein isolate i guess that's also more in line with traditional consumption is the the idea of eating more minimally um, or unprocessed forms of, of soy, that kind of makes sense there. What about dairy? That's another one that comes up. Um, and many people might be thinking, should I put uh, cow's milk into my coffee or soy? And when when dairy sort of enters this conversation around cancer, um, you know, some people sort of paint it to be uh, poison and it, you know, drastically increases risk of cancer. When I've looked at the um, World Cancer Research Fund's information that they put out, you know, there there might be some limited evidence that it can increase risk of prostate, but it seems to maybe be protective for certain types of cancer like colorectal. So how, how do you kind of, um, I guess, make sense of all of the available data on dairy and cancer? So it's a great question and a little bit hard to tease out, but what, like you alluded to, prostate cancer, 
There are multiple studies that have shown where dairy increases the risk of prostate cancer. So I think the association in cancer is the strongest for prostate cancer. And I think with colorectal cancer, the thought is that the calcium in dairy is what may be protective when patients have a dairy to reduce risk of like and and colorectal cancer risk is reduced but when we think about dairy and we think about what could be the mechanisms around dairy and cancer growth i think we can think about it from maybe three different ways so one would be inflammation could dairy be causing some inflammation in um, the body because of consuming proteins and other things that are from another um, you know species and not for us Another way would be uh, looking at through IGF-1. So there have been studies showing that people who don't consume dairy have lower IGF-1 levels than those who do consume dairy. And then I think the third way would be through hormones. So dairy comes from cows who are pregnant and then the hormonally driven. So it could be high levels of bovine estrogen or other things. And that's why I think there's an association more with hormonally driven cancer. So I think endometrial breast and prostate, but the highest, you know, link is with prostate and very little suggestive evidence around endometrial and breast. So I think dairy has like multiple different ways. And then when you think about whether the saturated fat or cholesterol or add other things in, it can make it more complicated. So what do you say to a patient that says, just tell me what to do, soy or, or dairy? What am I adding to my cereal or putting in my coffee? So I, I think that, you know, with soy, there seems to be more, you know, evidence of the reduced cancer risk around um, it being also a plant-based food, the fiber and the, the uh, isoflavones and all of that. I do think that dairy, w- what ends up happening is those who do consume dairy do consume dairy in very high amounts. So I think also reducing it to a smaller amount if you're planning to consume dairy is another way to think about it. And it's more also quantity. Um, that matters. So, uh, but again, I don't think we have a very clear answer to say th- this way or the other. Neil, I don't know. If you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. I agree, Urvi. I tell my patients the same thing. I think, you know, we're kind of in this state right now where there's a lot of um, murky and maybe not so murky observational evidence. Um, but not not enough direct evidence. And and this is going to sound cliche, but I think a lot of the dosage uh, studies do support the whole moderation is key approach. And I think the way that I, I view that perhaps is maybe even a little more nuanced is we've been talking about diversity, microbiome diversity, but dietary diversity as well. And when we're in an environment where we have so much diversity in terms of the foods we can consume, I think if we take that approach, maybe not the the moderation approach, but more so let's achieve dietary diversity. Let's minimize those foods that we know are directly associated with cancer risk, but let's achieve d- dietary diversity. Then you will be hitting that kind of moderation approach and you won't be hitting those dosage levels that have been associated um, with, with worse outcomes, be it dairy or soy or, or whatever else. Uh, it is. So, so I, I'll tell my patients, you know, if you want to dr- put dairy milk in your coffee, go ahead. But if you want to eat, you know, three servings of, of yogurt and drink your glass of milk at, at, at breakfast and at, at bedtime, that might be a high dose uh, of dairy that I, that I would avoid. And you mentioned IGF-1 as sort of one of the possible mechanisms underpinning the development of cancer or progression of cancer. And often this is where protein comes up amount and source um so again i'm a patient and i say doc you know do i need to consider how much protein i'm eating i've read online that protein is going to having high protein intake is going to increase my risk of of cancer um or perhaps affect my ability to beat cancer what are your thoughts on that so the approach that that I take to a macronutrient like protein is is really a body composition approach. Um, you know, I think that um, it's particularly in in breast and and colon cancer and prostate cancer um, and some other cancers where we have direct associations between body composition and outcomes. One of our priorities is to achieve an ideal body composition, uh, and so here we want to reduce 
fat levels, of course. Uh, but we want to do this in a way that doesn't necessarily compromise lean mass, because, of course, we know that lean mass is important to support insulin signaling, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and also to decrease inflammation uh, as well. So protein, the way that I view protein is, a, is an approach to maintain or increase our lean mass while also decreasing um, adiposity. If we, if we have an individual in whom we are trying to achieve weight loss, global weight loss, uh, then achieving protein levels of 1 to 1 1.2 grams per kilograms a day is a way to maintain um, uh, lean mass or even increase lean mass if we're skewing towards the 1.2 or even as high as 1.5 grams per kilogram level uh, per day. Um, but in terms of protein, again, that kind of isolated view of protein as a macronutrient that might have direct effects on cancer and IGF signaling in it and insulin, yes, I think that plays a role, but I think the greater impact is the impact on or the effect on lean mass and the ratio of lean to fat mass and how that systemically uh, impacts our body. And, and also to add to that, meaning I, I think, uh, you know, it, it has to be tailored to each patient. And sometimes if your patient's losing weight or things like that, we would have to decide. But there's one epidemiologic study that looked at uh, protein and th those who consumed lower protein had reduced risk of cancer. So, so again, it's, it's, um, hard to fully, you know, say definitely do this or that because many patients with cancer are losing weight or are cachectic. But I think that if we're thinking about reduction in risk with bringing IGF-1 level down, then I think that that's one of the mechanisms through which lower protein diets may be associated with less cancer risk. What I'm kind of hearing in trying to summarize uh, what both of you just put forward there is IGF-1 might be an underlying mechanism and might be something that we need to keep an eye on. Um, and and we, we probably don't want really elevated levels of that. But body composition is also very important. So we, we probably don't want to like restrict protein to the point that it's really having a negative effect on our body comp. And we're losing not only body fat, but we're losing lean mass at the same time. Exactly. I would agree with that. Yes. Quick one. A lot of people ask me for tips on buying supplements and getting blood tests. I've created zero cost guides for both of these, which you can download from my website, theproof.com. Okay, speaking about protein, that, that makes me think about red meat. And I think there's uh, more agreement or alignment when it comes to processed uh, red meats, um, deli meats like salami and, and certain types of bacon, etc. But unprocessed red meat seems to always be in the headlines. And the, the WCRF, they, they say that there is strong evidence that consumption of either red or processed meat are both causes of colorectal cancer. Uh, what's, what's your view on specifically on the data looking at unprocessed red meat like lamb chops or steak and um, whether they're increasing someone's risk of developing colorectal cancer? I think the data with uh, red meat unprocessed is not as strong as processed red meat, as you already said. So with un the IARC, which is, um, you know, a body that kind of tries to come together and define what are carcinogens, they have a grouping system, like group one is a definite carcinogen, group two is a probable carcinogen. So processed meat is c considered a group one carcinogen, so it's a definite carcinogen, and red meat is a probable carcinogen, group two. And when they, they quantify the risk, they say for processed meat, every 50 grams of processed meat consumed daily is associated with an increased risk of colorectal cancer of about 18%. And when we think about uh, red meat, they say 100 grams per day is associated with a relative increased risk of 17%. But th that data is not as strong as for the processed meat. So when we think about it from mechanisms or how could you know processed meat be doing this, um, and also red meat, um, there's a nice paper in Cancer Discovery from a few years ago where they looked at um, FF, like, um, 
samples from colorectal cancer patients. So they had 900 samples of these and they were able to do like whole exome sequencing on this and look at the signature. So what kind of mutational signature or patterns are they seeing? And they saw this alkylator pattern. And then they also had history on these patients on what was their diet like, whether they were eating more red and processed meat, poultry or fish, and they looked at each one separately or and they categorized them into quartiles and looked at, is there a difference? And what they showed is that the highest decile of processed or red meat, both of them were associated with higher likelihood of having this alkylator signature in the tumor. And this higher risk of having this alkylator signature, they found that if the highest quartile of this alkylator signature, meaning th those tumors that had most of this alkylating signature also had worst survival. So what they show is an association with diet and only for red and processed meat, not with poultry or fish, is associated with this alkylator signature in the tumor mutational signature associated with worse survival, suggesting that diet is truly playing a role in development of the tumor and then also in the outcomes post the tumor. If someone's thinking, I wonder what that risk is, you know, they're trying to, to weigh up the risk versus reward. You know, someone might be listening and thinking, well, I just, I love red meat. I love lamb chops. I love steak. Um, you know, I hear that there's an increase in risk, but what does that actually mean? You know, if if I'm a healthy body weight, I'm not I'm not overweight, not obese. Um, and I'm eating a hundred grams of red meat a day or more. What are we talking about here in terms of, I guess, an absolute change in in someone's risk of developing colorectal cancer, if that's possible to answer? I think that's a harder question. When these studies are, are looking at it, it's more a relative risk. So if, if a cancer is rare in itself, which is often, then the absolute risk is really small, but the relative risk is, you know, what we, we talked about 18% with the every 15, 50 grams. So it's a question of looking at it with the absolute risk, which would not look that high, but if you look at it as relative risk, then it is. I, I would just add that I think I, I think Irvi very nicely talked about the biology through which unprocessed red meat can be associated with increased risk or worse outcomes for colorectal cancer. And and a key point that really hit me from the studies that that she's alluding to, uh, and the studies we've been talking about, is, is dosage. And that's where I think that in these discussions with people who who do enjoy consuming red meat. That's where we people can make an informed decision about what their their dosage will look like. And if an individual is okay with an absolute risk increase of you know ten percent, which is really quite high, uh, that's associated with fairly high doses of unprocessed red meat. I mean, you'd have to be eating red meat basically every day. Whereas if somebody wants to do everything they possibly can uh, to reduce their absolute risk, let's say get it down to less than 5%, then yes, you would need to minimize your unprocessed red meat intake, maybe eat a steak only once a month or less than that. So I think that that's the kind of data that I really like from extracting from some of these studies is, how can we uh, allow folks to make or, or give folks the tools to make informed decisions and what kind of risk threshold are they are is acceptable to their quality of life right yeah i think that at a patient level can get confusing um because you know statistics are confusing and and often the conversation can be boiled down to good or bad as opposed to well, what's the actual risk that we're we're sort of talking about here and then allowing people to make a more informed decision as you say you mentioned glyphosate earlier and i i, I made a note to come back to this so i'm often asked around what are my thoughts around conventional versus organic produce? You know, patients in front of you and says, do I need to buy organic? Is conventional produce that is sprayed with herbicides and pesticides, is that, are they carcinogenic and are they increasing my risk of cancer? So uh, two papers come to mind when I think about this. And I think there's a lot of debate around organic versus non-organic and risk of cancer from patients and even, um, you know, the general population. 
And when one of the studies is the NutriNet Sand prospective study that was published in 2018 in JAMA Internal Medicine. And what they showed is that a higher frequency of organic foods was associated with a reduced risk of cancer. So quartile one compared to quartile four. And I think the hazard ratio was about 0.75. So that only the quartile four seemed to benefit, not quartile three or two uh, compared to one. However, a lot, you know, association studies are always fraught with the issue of can it be that because they are eating organic, they're also the type of people who are looking after their lifestyle more and they're exercising regularly, eating more plant based foods and living a healthier lifestyle. And that's why they have that lower risk. And so another study that, um, you know, helps sort of answer this is from Rice et al. in 2012. And what they looked at is cancer risk and they es estimated it through looking at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency methods. And they also used rodent bioassays and pesticide residue sampling data. And what they did in that study is that they said that approximately 20,000 cancer cases could be prevented per year from increasing fruit and vegetable consumption, while up to 10 cancer cases per year could be caused by added pesticide consumption from the fruits and vegetables that we eat. So if you think about what the benefit is, the benefit is much greater than the risk. And so what I would say to patients and uh, non-patients and people thinking about this is that it's more important to eat your fruits and vegetables than worry about whether you're getting organic or not, because there is a significant benefit in terms of that. And if somebody is very much like, oh, I really want to know what each fruit and vegetable and the risk of that, then maybe you can think about the ones that, um, you know, that are a higher risk to have pesticides and like the Environmental Protection Agency and some of these come out with a list of ones that are more likely to have pesticide contaminant or residue on it. But in general, I would say, you know, I wouldn't worry about it and try to eat as much as you can because people aren't getting enough fruits and vegetables. In. Okay. Well, well, well explained. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and it makes me think, you know, often when someone's not eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, well, what are they eating instead? And and sixty percent of the average American's calories are these ultra processed foods. I think in the UK, it's fifty percent of the average person's calories. In Australia, where I'm from, it's basically the same. And I think it was the the same um, Nutri uh, Net group same. that published yeah. a paper on ultra processed foods and risk mm -hmm. of cancer, and. You know, a lot of people are talking about this, the, the fact that ultra processed foods associate with higher risk of cancer. And I'm, I'm interested in whether you've given any thought as to why that is. Is it is it the fact that the people eating these are not getting exposure to all of these phytochemicals and flavonoids and fiber? Um, or are there sort of inherent properties of these ultra processed foods that you see as sort of carcinogenic? So I think that there are probably multiple factors that are contributing to the association. Certainly there are carcinogenic elements in ultra processed foods. The, the actual processing um, uh, is, is generating uh, carcinogens that can be directly harmful. Uh, but I think in addition to that, uh, and you alluded to this, Simon, is that there's also what foods are, are being replaced by ultra processed foods. And so the lack of exposure to protective foods that we've been talking about is also a major issue for diets that are high in ultra processed foods. And then I would also say that ultra processed foods tend to be the types of foods that are not contributing to satiety uh, and are also contributing to uh, uh, greater desire to consume that particular food. And so it's, it's this sort of vicious cycle where you're being exposed to carcinogens, you're not being exposed to protective foods, and you're consuming a food that is prompting you to want more of that food without providing you with adequate nutrition. I think all of that is contributing to the, that association. Just one more thing to add would be, I think ultra processed foods are in inherently high calorie foods. So it adds to the risk of the obesity burden or epidemic that we're dealing with through, you know, just consuming more of that leads to higher adiposity. Yeah, I've been 
interested to follow Kevin Hall's work and trying to tease out what is it about these foods that leads to overconsumption. And they seem at, at this stage anyway to be kind of narrowing in on energy density, hyperpalatability, and eating rate. These foods are, re- you can eat a lot of these foods really quickly. So, um, all, all really interesting stuff. I want to finish here with uh, two other parts of our lifestyle um, alcohol and exercise. So perhaps we we start with alcohol, the the elephant in the room that um, perhaps perhaps some people don't want me to ask about here. Um, but it seems like recommendations vary; they've changed a bit. Um, you know, different fields of medicine maybe have different views based on the data relative to the disease states that they're interested in. Um, what do do you kind of feel? when it comes to, or how do you feel when it comes to alcohol and our risk of cancer? So alcohol, initially, you know, there used to be a safe limit or at least a number where we would say that if you have two drinks per week, um, that's okay. Anything more than that, that's an issue. But more lately, alcohol has been looked at as any amount of alcohol over not drinking alcohol is a risk factor and people need to decide for themselves how much of that they want to. So I think no, it's no longer like, okay, if you're in, within that limit, you're okay. It's more a dose dependent issue of how much you're drinking and the risk for development of um, cancer because alcohol has been linked to multiple different cancers. What's, what's the main mechanism there by which alcohol is... is- increasing risk of cancer acetaldehyde and that's acetaldehyde is a known carcinogen and i think maybe directly as alcohol too uh, so so i would add that uh so acetaldehyde and generation of free radicals uh is is um the mech- the, the the pathway through which cancer promotion is supported by alcohol and i i, I just want to reiterate it you know i think that Irvi's point about no safe level of alcohol in terms of a cancer endpoint. So when we think about cancer specifically, most, almost all of the recent studies that have been published uh, show us that there really is unfortunately no safe level of alcohol as we previously used to think. Sorry to any folks who didn't want to hear that, um, but better to, better to be armed with the information and we can decide if we act on it or not. Um, Exercise. So your trial uh, that we spoke about before, you're integrating exercise into the intervention. What do we understand about the amount or type of exercise that is sort of optimal, I guess, for, for preventing cancer? Perhaps we start with prevention. So exercise is an incredibly powerful tool, I would, I would say, uh, for both reducing the risk of cancer, and also improving outcomes uh, after a cancer diagnosis. And I'll also mention it's also a powerful tool for improving tolerability of cancer treatment. Uh, There have now been several trials which have actually demonstrated that exercise is more effective than medications for dealing with cancer treatment side effects. So if we get to the the risk reduction or prevention setting that that you raised, Simon, there have now been several uh, observational studies which have demonstrated uh, very clear associations with significant hazard ratios, uh, showing a reduction in the risk of developing multiple different types of cancer uh, with exercise and primarily aerobic exercise. Uh, and this is the basis for several of the current exercise recommendations, essentially 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise uh, per week. And we think that this is due to multiple different effects. We know that exercise can improve uh, hormone signaling, insulin signaling. It can reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines in in our circulation. Um, And we think that it may also have direct anti-tumor effects. So we now have evidence that exercise can modulate the local immune microenvironment. Exercise can increase certain immune cell population, T cell populations, natural killer cell populations, uh, that can uh, attack developing cancer cells. Uh, exercise can also make immune cells more functional or more cytotoxic so that they can uh, have more cancer cell kill efficacy. 
Uh, and in addition to all of that, of course, we know that exercise is a great way for energy balance and maintaining a healthy body composition, both lean and, and, and reducing fat mass. Uh, so ultimately, I would uh, again say that aerobic exercise is a really powerful tool for modifying our biology uh, to reduce our risk of developing cancer. There is now more and more work looking at resistance exercise as well uh, and the beneficial effects of, of resistance training. Uh, we certainly know that building lean mass has positive effects on insulin signaling and reduction of inflammation. Resistance training also has positive effects on bone density, which is a major issue for those patients that are undergoing cancer treatment. Uh, and resistance exercise may also have direct effects on, on uh, immune cell populations as well, uh, as I've mentioned. So I think that we're sort of, from the cancer perspective, we're still sort of catching up on the effects of resistance training. Uh, a lot of the data supports aerobic training. And I would certainly uh, uh, recommend exercise for cancer prevention. So if I was to kind of summarize some of the things we've spoken about um, for cancer prevention, um, we didn't speak about smoking, but I'm assuming we're, we're not wanting people to smoke. Um, that kind of goes without saying. Uh, the, the recommendation for alcohol is zero is the, the best intake level when it comes to cancer risk reduction. Um, we, we want to be striving towards a healthy body weight and not having excessive adiposity where we can. Um, exercising, resistance training, and some cardiovascular. Um, the type of dietary pattern is this plant forward. It's very high fiber, rich in phytochemicals. Um, if someone was thinking, can, can you go out and do a blood test? from a prevention point of view and, and what would you be looking at? Is it mainly these metabolic markers like insulin and HbA1c or what, what else could someone look at on a sort of basic blood test to perhaps indicate that they are low risk for the development of cancer? Another one you could add, so I think, you, like you said, insulin, hemoglobin A1c, another one could be CRP or inflammation. But again, these are all very non-specific and it could be due to multiple other reasons. So I would caution against thinking that just because you have one of these things that the risk is very clearly elevated. But I think like diabetes is linked with cancer as um, and there's a lot of associations with that. So having a normal hemoglobin A1C, normal insulin, uh, lower insulin levels, those all things could help. Other things I think, um, it could be if you're thinking about looking at microbiome or profiling that, but those all become an additional level of tests which may not be covered by insurance or are not standardized yet. From the breast cancer perspective, uh, we've been very interested in trying to develop a blood-based signature that could predict for metabolically uh, stimulated breast cancers. And certainly a lot of the uh, metabolic markers that we've just discussed um, are, are indicative of or associated with breast cancer risk. But I will say that the marker that has come up in our studies multiple time and other group studies multiple time is actually triglyceride levels. Triglyceride levels seem to be one of the strongest predictors of adipose tissue inflammation in the breast, as well as higher levels of aromatase in the breast. And from a risk prediction standpoint, the other marker that seems to be one of the strongest predictors of breast and several other cancers uh, is going back to body composition. Independent of BMI, we have now seen in several studies that uh, total body fat percentage above about 35 to 36% is strongly predictive of the development of obesity-related cancers, even in individuals who have a normal body mass index. And is there anything else we would we would add to that that list of kind of overall lifestyle? Um, how do how do things like stress and sleep? Is there much data in in terms of how these could affect our risk of cancer? I would say that sleep is incredibly important. Um, there have now been a couple of studies in the oncology setting which have looked at weight loss interventions, dietary or exercise weight loss interventions, and again and again we're seeing that those individuals with that are reporting less sleep or poor quality sleep uh, are less likely 
uh, to lose similar amounts of weight despite the same dietary or the same exercise intervention as, uh, as individuals who are achieving adequate and high quality sleep. Okay. And screening. It would be remiss of me not to, to ask you about important sort of times of someone's life to, I realize that it might, might differ depending on gender and type of cancer we're talking about. But I guess, Neil, relative to breast cancer, firstly, um, is how important is screening? Screening is incredibly important. Uh, we, we do know that mammography, uh, which is the gold standard uh, for breast cancer screening, is associated with improvements in overall survival. Uh, and that mammography can uh, detect breast cancers early. Uh, and also uh, can uh, detect uh, breast cancers that are not physically detectable by either the patient themselves uh, or the clinician. So we do recommend mammography starting at age 40. Uh, there has been some controversy in terms of what age to start. Uh, some groups recommend starting at age 50, uh, but uh, um, I would say most groups are still recommending age 40. And that age may actually be slightly younger based on if an individual has a genetic syndrome or a primary family member who's been impacted by breast cancer as well. The issue with mammography in younger individuals is that it's not as accurate uh, because of dense breast tissue, uh, but this can be overcome with using ultrasound in addition uh, to mammography. So this is an incredibly useful tool uh, that, that people should be running to pursue, I would argue. And then just to add, um, you know, in colorectal cancer, there's colonoscopies and screening there, which is a very widely done um, tool used. And in other cancers like multiple myeloma, which I treat, there's actually a very interesting nationwide study in Iceland happening called the I Stop Myeloma Trial. And that trial is basically screening the whole country for this protein, abnormal protein, and then looking and dividing them into different cohorts to see uh, if finding this abnormal protein early is associated with our survival, overall survival benefit. So I think sometimes, you know, when we screen, we might find this, but increase anxiety in patients or stress. But does this really translate into a overall survival benefit or a true clinical endpoint? So this study is looking at that question specifically for myeloma, because we have these precursor disorders like MGUS and smoldering myeloma, where we, the standard of care is observation, but it, it would be good to be able to treat early if we knew that, you know, it's impacting survival. And that's kind of where a lot of my trials are looking at, we call the nutrivention trials, where we are looking at uh, diet in this uh, uh, prevention setting where we're not doing any other chemotherapy and we're able to look to see if we can reduce the risk of development of the cancer and alter the trajectory long term for patients. Sounds like you guys are, are both involved in some some really interesting trials. So I'll definitely have to to carve out some time and get you back on when some of those results are are available. Um, the other one that I often hear um, come up when talking about screening is prostate cancer. Right. So prostate cancer screening um, is has has become a bit controversial, um, but certainly um, we know that um, prostate cancer screening you by measuring PSA. Uh, uh, is is a useful tool, particularly for high risk populations like African American uh, or, or Black populations, uh, which are uh, unfortunately at higher risk for being diagnosed with high grade prostate cancers. Um, so we certainly do support uh, PSA screening, uh, and the age varies does vary uh, by race. Some of the other tools for prostate cancer screening, for example, digital rectal exam, uh, have, have been shown to be less useful, but may be helpful in conjunction with PSA testing uh, for high-risk populations, again, going back to Black populations or those that have a genetic syndrome or family history. To finish off here, I'm interested in kind of how you think about um, what we're speaking about today as a, as a problem um, and solving this problem. So if we think about the increasing rates of prevalence of certain cancers, obesity-related cancers, um, we think about the nutrition interventions that you're doing and the answers that may come from that. I guess a separate question is, how do you get everyone 
to to do what you're saying. And um, you know, it seems to me that you know people that are are of privilege and are listening to this podcast, they can you know many of them can certainly go out and make some changes. But as two people who really want to see cancer gone from society, how do you think about getting to the root cause of the problem, which to me seems like we've constructed ways of living and have food environments and cities that are set up that promote sedentary lifestyles um, that make it near impossible to take information from clinical studies and actually get it um, make impact across a society. How do you kind of reconcile all of that? If 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 that's even something that I realize that you, you, that's not your job to try and um, change the way our societies are set up, but is it something that you think about every day? Yes, <laughs> every day. And I think that you know this is so incredibly important because that's the ultimate impact of the work that we're doing. Is it, it unfortunately a lot of um, the the populations that do not have access to healthy foods or that live in built environments that support behaviors that are not particularly healthy. Those are the groups where we see the highest rates of not just the incidence of cancer, but the highest rates of aggressive cancers. So this is an incredibly important question. Uh, and the way that, you know, the way that I think about this uh, is, and I always put out the caveat and I forgot to do that at the beginning of our conversation, which is, which is now it's biting me in the butt because I'm being asked this question by you. But I always say that I'm not a behavioral scientist. Uh, and I, I rely heavily on my behavioral scientist colleagues to address that question of how do we change behavior? But what, what I think is particularly important and the work that, and the reason why I'm motivated to do this work is, I don't think that we should be changing people's behavior unless we know that that behavior change is effective. Um, and that's kind of the type of work that we're looking at because I think a lot of people can't, for, let's look at exercise. I think people can get overwhelmed by this notion of more is better. I need to be running marathons eventually. I need to be doing more, more, more to reduce my cancer risk as low as possible. But we have seen in several observational studies now a threshold effect where when we look at a cancer risk endpoint, after a certain dose of exercise, there doesn't seem to be an additional benefit of exercise, at least for cancer risk reduction. Cardiometabolic effects are, are separate, but uh, that's why ultimately I think we need these highly controlled trials like the ones that Urvi and I are running and others are running where we're delivering the foods I, I, I didn't mention, but in our exercise trials, we're delivering treadmills to all of our participants. Every single session is individualized exercise prescriptions. This is in collaboration with Dr. Lee Jones, who heads our exercise oncology service here. Um, and that way we can deliver a prescribed precision intervention. In these trials, we eliminate those issues of access and so forth so that we can ask this pure biology question and then ultimately take it to our behavioral scientists, our policy makers, and so forth, and say, here is the hard data. This is why health insurance policies and Medicare, Medicaid in the, in the United States now cover screening tools like colonoscopies uh, and other tools that have been directly linked to improve survival and reduce cancer. If we can generate that hard data with highly controlled interventions, we can then garner the support that we need to make public health changes. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, an incredible point. I mean, the more controlled a study is, often the less the less you can kind of generalize from that and, and apply it to to a population. But as you say, at least you can be really sure in your results, and then you can go about working out ways to to modulate behavior. So. Um, the work that both you're doing is, is is absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much for for coming on and, and sharing. And as I said earlier, I'd love to have you on when any of your your results um, from future studies become available. Um, if folks would like to connect with you and and uh, learn more about the work that you're doing, is there a website or some socials that we should send them to? Yes, we can share. Uh, so the, I would say the first place to go would be uh, mskcc.org. 
that's the hospital website, uh, and they can find both of our profiles there in the way, best ways to contact us. We are both active on social as well. My Twitter handle is at Neil, my first name, underscore, my last name, Iyengar, N-E-I-L, underscore, I-Y-E-N-G-A-R. And I'll let Urbi tell everyone her hit, uh, Twitter handle as well. Yeah, so t- on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, all of them, my uh, handle is at Urvisha, M-D, so U-R-V-I-S-H-A-H-M-D. So it's the same in all places. Wonderful. Well, Irvi, Neil, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and uh, hope we can do this again sometime soon. Would love that. And really, thank you so much for this opportunity. We really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you, Simon. There we go, friends. Thank you for showing up and the effort you're making to take better control of your health. I look forward to hanging.